of it escapes congressional oversight. Some of it's through private contractors linked to the Pentagon. We've seen joint command exchange, exchange training and private military contract training uh, that has been directly and indirectly tied to Rwandan forces implicated in gross human rights violations. We know that the U.S. through AFRICOM has more military operations in Africa now than the Middle East. 22% of U.S. humanitarian aid to Africa is distributed by the Pentagon. So there's certainly a weaponization of aid. UN policy is dangerous fuel. That powerful uh, and U.S. policy, powerful insiders at the U.S. Uh, establishment and military establishment, as I said, have hidden these crimes that uh, some of which I've just described, protected the RPF from prosecution at international tribunals and peddled this false narrative about what he did in 1994, allowing him to infiltrate international institutions. So what that has done has emboldened him. His regime over the last 30 years has been highly effective in mass spree and serial killing. Washington has therefore enabled Kagame's crimes and become an ingredient in the fire that is burned in the Great Lakes region of Africa since 1990. So just um, a very short comment about the international apologia as oxygen for the fire. Um, Kambale mentioned that I got into um, researching this through the prism of Congo in 97. Uh, I saw the direct impact of Kagame's violence uh, in the Congolese forests and in villages and towns. At that time, we had intellectual elites like Philip Gorovich from The New Yorker, British and British academic Alex DeWall, who legitimized uh, RPF violence, not only in Rwanda, but certainly in Congo. Thousands of Rwandan refugees who were chased further into Congo were prey for Kagame. They were viewed in Western media uh, as either genocidaires uh, or their families were fearing justice. So um, that that I think is is key. I, I, I want I mentioned these two individuals because I see them uh, as among kingmakers, among Western elites who have helped. Um, enable Paul Kagame's impunity over the last quarter century. Many people have built their careers around this propaganda and one-sided genocide narrative. They are invested in protecting the perpetrator and they have helped make Paul Kagame king. Um, there are so many of these people in academia, in mainstream journalism, uh, in political and military establishments. I'm not going to go through them all, but I'm just going to uh, mention a few of the top of my list here today. Bill Clinton. With Madeleine Albright at the time, during the genocide, helped thwart UN intervention to halt the massacres of Tutsis and Hutus in a bid to allow the RPF to seize power. Clinton has stated that Kagame's freed the hearts and minds of the Rwandan people. Under Clinton's watch, the U.S. greenlit the invasion of Congo by Kagame's forces. And when the U.N. mapping report was released, which uh, revealed uh, that Kagame's troops may have committed genocide against Congolese Hutu and uh, Rwandan Hutus, Clinton said he was not going to prejudge Kagame because he really didn't know much what happened there. Susan Rice is another kingmaker. She's a former uh, assistant secretary of state for African affairs. She's helped shield Kagame from international censure at the UN. She once worked for the strategic analysis uh, firm here in Washington called IntelliBridge, whose company officials include ex-CIA director John Deutsch and National Security Advisor Anthony Lake. The firm has done work for Kagame. When she was Obama's ambassador to the UN, Rice uh, watered down a security um, council resolution that, na that named and shamed Rwanda for supporting the uh, M23. So 
so she's uh, worked to downplay his crimes and protect him, as certainly at the UN. Oh. Tony Blair, um, former UK Prime Minister. Sorry, he has been one of Kagame's biggest cheerleaders. And he's responsible for kind of opening uh, the tax of uh, financial aid, international aid for, for Kagame. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry about this. So, and he's built this cult of personality around Kagame. Going and okay. Fix it. I don't know. I For don't those know of you who interested, we will make sure to give you a copy of the slides. So make sure that you're sharing uh, the table. And at the end of the event, we'll email you a copy of the slides so you can have it. So, um, um, yeah. So Tony Blair's is somebody who's, you know, for give you an example. Uh, on the 20th anniversary of the genocide, Britain poured half a billion pounds into the impoverished nation. We also have a number of other key people, I won't mention all of them, who helped create in books, in literature, uh, and in NGOs, which had an influence at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the official narrative. And Rakia Omar and Alex Dewal, whose name I mentioned earlier, who worked for an NGO called African Rights. Um, they wrote a defining book called Death, Defiance, and Despair, and that had a very big uh, impact on uh, the legal proceedings initially at the ICTR. And also Human Rights Watch has picked up, uh, has cited African Rights and D&D's &D, uh, work about 42 po uh, times in, in their seminal account of the genocide. Philip Gorovich, I just, I'll, I'll end with him. I've got a lot of other people to speak about, but I'm just gonna end it there in terms of the King. Philip Gorovich, he's for years extolled the virtues of Kagame. His work has been highly ideological. Um, he was critical of UN efforts to probe RPF atrocities of Rwandan and Congolese Hutus. Um, many years ago, and then when the mapping report was released in 2010, he refused to address the substance of the accusation against Kagame's troops that they may have committed genocide. Instead, he wrote that it was difficult to see how this could lead to any trials. Um, there was very little detail connecting individually identified perpetrators or victims. So he um, tried to, I think, undermine uh, or, or uh, make it sound as if this investigation was not uh, legitimate. Uh, one of the things that I've been very frustrated with over the years is the lack of empirical studies, uh, qualitative and quali quantitative studies about why Rwandan, in particular Rwandan Hutus, fled Rwanda in 1994 in the first place. And this is probably one of the reasons we don't fully understand the dynamics of the genocide and that we don't know enough about what the RPF did to Hutus. A number of academics, journalists, and other observers have ruled out uh, my thesis and uh, others who have said the same thing, that the RPF committed genocide without doing rigorous research on the RPF's record without doing interviews and collecting interviews from the uh, Hutus that fled uh, during the genocide of 1994. So my book, In Praise of Blood, um, is based on more than 200 sources, direct and contextual witnesses, and they're survivors of atrocities. They're former members of Kagame's military, and in particular deserters who are not aligned with political party in exile. I've interviewed aid workers, officials at the UN, the ICTR, and Western governments. And the testimony is bolstered 
by leaked documents, like Kambale said, from the ICTR Special Investigations Unit. This was a clandestine unit that probed RPF crimes. Uh, I also have a fair amount of exculpatory evidence from ICTR trial proceedings. So the core conclusions of my book, RPF ignited the genocide by shooting down the plane carrying the Rwandan and Burundian presidents. Immediately after the plane attack, soldiers from the RPF military intelligence, high command, battalion and training wing began carrying out systematic massacres of Hutu civilians in areas the RPF had seized. Mobile forces operated quickly from the north and headed a southeast through the prefectures. Well-planned operations that were not reprisal killings, they were preemptive and began in zones already under their control in April 1994. They targeted Hutus in swamps and fields, <coughs> community leaders first, then peasants, peasants. Large groups of Hutus were called to the meetings, killed with guns, grenades, and Agafuni hose. Hutus were dumped in mass graves with Tutsis massacred by Hutu militias. The RPF loaded thousands of people onto trucks, mostly at night, brought them to Gabiro where they were shot and burned. Journalists were, who were in Rwanda during the genocide were uh, monitored highly by the RPF and they were strictly controlled. So the RPF killings of Hutus, I posit, were highly organized, systematic, amounted to attempts to destroy in part Hutus as an ethnic group. These operations continued to a lesser degree in later years. This at the same time, of course, as Tutsis were systematically slaughtered in Hutu-controlled zones and were victims of a genocide. Hutu militia and elements of the state, often local, committed genocide against Hutus. I also say that the RPF fueled the genocide against Tutsis by infiltrating this is quite complicated. Infiltrating Hutu militias by various, with various members of their commandos and helped kill Tutsis in clandestine relation, uh, operations throughout Rwanda. And the infiltration by RPF commandos of Hutu militias throughout the country was key to the RPF success in seizing territory. And it gives us clues about how the genocide unfolded. More research is needed to understand the genocide against Tutsis. Tutsi survivors and RPF deserters live in terror and many are afraid to give their accounts. So, recap, the assumptions versus evidence. Paul Kagame stopped the genocide committed by Hutus against Tutsis. No, he ignited and fueled the genocide of Tutsis. RPF massacres of Hutu civilians during and after the genocide were essentially reprisal killings. No. Immediately after shooting down the plane, RPF organized death squads targeting Hutu community leaders and they managed the and peasants and they concealed these massacres. It was well planned, organized, and massive. And it continued on a smaller scale for years. Civil participation in the genocide was only Hutu against Tutsi. This is not true. Tutsi civilians also were perpetrators. They participated in the violence against Hutus, directly assisting the RPF as well. The UN tribunal set up to try the most serious violations committed in, in Rwanda in 1994 fulfilled its mandate by convicting more than 60 individuals all with ties to the former Hutu regime, therefore contributing to the country's difficult process of reconciliation. That's another assumption. That is bogus. That the United States influenced the UN tribunal in Kagame's favor, shielded the RPF from prosecution, and cemented his impunity and dictatorship for decades to come. So the propaganda system that it's worth... Um, doing some reading on, has uh, established the RPF moral legitimacy, demonized the Hutu population, steered legal proceedings uh, against uh, Hutu opponents, 
and garnered support from the international community. So going forward, um, so many whistleblowers uh, and witnesses and victims have tried to alert the international community to these crimes, but as I said, they've been intimidated, jailed, silenced, or killed, and the West concealing, deliberately concealing this evidence has not helped. There's a number of uh, evidence and crimes and investigations that were um, completed that never made it to the indictment stage and never were prosecuted. I mention these in my book. One of the key points I'd like to share with you as I wrap this up and uh, let Claude speak is uh, a Faustian bargain that was um, that was uh, struck in 2003 uh, at the ICTR, um, investigations that showed that Kagame's troops had shot down the plane, massacred Hutus, and fueled the genocide against Tutsis. The ICTR clandestine <coughs> investigative unit had this prima facie evidence, and the U.S. ambassador for war crimes, Pierre Prosper, engin engineered a deal that transferred the jurisdiction of uh, investigating and prosecuting RPF crimes from the United Nations to the Rwandan government itself. So the deal was illegal and a breach of trust, and it amounted to letting the killers investigate themselves. So I guess the takeaway is that, you know, um, there's a sense from victims, anyhow, that uh, they're... they're uh, their suffering doesn't matter. The refusal um, to to prosecute the RPF and the internet has the international community is basically saying to the victims that they're comfortable with Kagame's crimes. Briefly, geopolitical interests that are driving these policies um, we've seen uh, over the last thirty years. 20 years in particular, Washington shifting support to military and political actors who can open up the Great Lakes region to valuable strategic minerals and provide proxies to fight their wars on terror. Rwanda, as its trump card, is a valuable uh, contributor to UN peacekeeping. They have forces in Mali and Sudan. These countries are important nations in the Sahel, which contains vast uh, deposits of oil and natural gas which Washington seeks for its energy needs. There's also the criminal liability aspect for the U.S. government uh, being uh, complicit in Kagame's crimes because they had knowledge that were being committed and did not try to stop them. So it could be really argued that military assistance and satellite technology provided by U.S. to Kagame's troops amount to aiding and abetting these crimes. So um, my last um, minute, we'll just, uh, I'll share with you some policy recommendations because I understand it's really important to look forward uh, and see how we can address some of these things. I think we need to join efforts uh, in, in establishing a true historical record um, uh, devoid of propaganda. We need to listen to Congolese activists and civilians <laughs> and Rwandans who flee. We need to bring their story to the attention of Congress. We need to actively encourage Washington to reevaluate and reexamine its ties with Paul Kagame and the RPF, halt U.S. Rwanda military cooperation agreements, remove Rwanda from UN peacekeeping, support the creation of an ad hoc tribunal for crimes in Congo, lobby the ICC to investigate and prosecute Kagame for crimes he's committed since uh, the ICC was established in 2002. Help me get material proof of RPF crimes for civil and international courts by gaining access under the Freedom of Information Act to crucial US satellite images from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the NGA is part of your Department of Defense and they have the material proof of what the RPF was doing in their areas uh, during uh, that they quickly seized during the genocide, also what the RPF did in Congo. And I've tried to access through the Freedom of Information 
uh, Act some of these images. First, the uh, Geospatial Intelligence Agency told me they didn't have these images. Then uh, when I pushed them some more, they said those images would remain classified in order to protect national security. So whose national security is the United States trying to protect? some of those uh, things that you have uh, shared with us. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll make, I hope it's okay, make available the slides uh, okay. so that people can have that. So if you have signed up at the table and uh, we have your email, you'll make, we'll make sure that you get a copy of her slide presentation. Uh, so, so without further ado, we should move to our next speaker, <laughs> Claude Gattebouke, uh, a comrade, a brother. Uh, we've been working together for quite some time, and I always admire his courage as well, uh, speaking on behalf of uh, people who seek justice around the world, not just in Rwanda. So Claude Gat Gatebuke is a Rwandan genocide survivor, a civil war survivor as well, and a human rights advocate. He is the executive director and co-founder of the African Great Lakes Action Network. He is also a member of the Africa Great Lakes Advocacy Coalition, a coalition that unites over a dozen advocacy organizations with a common vision for a peaceful Great Lakes region of Africa. Found through, uh, and this was uh, founded uh, here in the United States with different organizations. Uh, Claude's advocacy uh, work focuses on genocide and mass atrocities prevention. Uh, Gatebuke is a well sought after speaker nationwide and across the globe by various institutions and he has been featured in various magazines, newspapers around the globe. And he's also been a guest at the White House uh, for a briefing uh, of leaders in the community. Uh, Claude, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kambali. Uh, it's an honor to be back here at IPS uh, speaking. Uh, and I'm uh, excited to see uh, a lot of friends I wouldn't call your names because I don't want to put you on a hit list. <laughs> uh, and detractors, welcome. <laughs> um, and it's also important, um, I think it's important that this event is happening here at IPS, given the history, especially the story of Orlando Letelier, who was killed here in the United States by the Chilean government that assassinated him, which is a practice that the Rwandan government under Kagame also practices inside and outside of Rwanda on the African continent and abroad. Um, so I'm not gonna be very long, well, I'll try to be brief. I heard that to be a good speaker, you have to be brief, be good and be gone, right? <laughs> um, what I wanna do is put a human face to these atrocities and share my story of survival and also uh, show what does this have to do with us, those of us in the room, US citizens? What is our role in all of this? Um, it's one thing to hear Africans killing each other. We're not violent people that just go out and, and, and kill each other. There is a hand by the US, and, and Judy's spoken about this a lot, so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. But I just wanna start with, uh, real quickly, um, my uh, personal story. So I was born in Rwanda, and I grew up thinking that Rwanda was the only country in the world. You guys know anybody else in America that thinks that way? <laughs> so um, it wasn't until what I was... Where were you born? <laughs> yeah. Just so we can put it in. Okay. Uh, yeah. And Sorry. that's okay. Um, the, when I was 10, a war started. And I heard the war started from Uganda. And they were like, I was like, what is Uganda? Or oh, that's another country. Oh, there's other countries. And so to me, there was no concept of other countries. I just thought, you know, Bob Marley was Rwandan. Muhammad Ali was Rwandan. You know, all of these people were Rwandan. And then I, I started to understand that it was a, a much larger world um, outside of Rwanda, but also that Rwanda had all of these, um, these three ethnicities, the Hutus, the Twas, and the Tutsis. And there was a group of Tutsis who were exiled 30 years prior, who had been a, uh, kicked out of power. 
and they were basically fighting their way back to um, um, take over. And so what happens is for the next four years, there is war, and that war produces massive atrocities, especially in areas that were occupied by these rebels. And Judy's spoken a little bit about that. I heard people who fled the, these atrocities talk about how they were called into meetings like this and grenades thrown into crowds. And those who survived were killed with hand weapons like hoes and, uh, and, and clubs. And people were like put in mass graves alive. Um, then there was also a rise of political riots. A whole bunch of political movements were born at the time. There was um, a lot of insecurity around the country. There were so many weapons around the country to the extent that it would have been cheaper for me to buy a grenade than it would have been for me to buy a bottle of soda or buy a loaf of bread. Uh, that's how crazy it was. But the resources were really strained because that war displaced about a million people from the northern part of the country. Rwanda is a very small country. It's the most densely populated country in the world, more densely populated than China that has over a billion people. Uh, so you have more people per square mile than you have in any other country in the world. So now, to put it in context of Washington, take 30 million Americans and move them to Washington, D.C. in a space of three years. What would that be like? Your cell phone reception, the lines at the grocery store, the traffic. I mean, your life totally changes. So that's how a lot of people started to come into contact with this war, especially where I was in Kigali. Fast forward four years later, there was a bunch of atrocities in this war. And then there was a shooting uh, that killed the president of Rwanda. Uh, he was, his plane was taken down. And that set off mass killings. It started, it sparked the genocide. There was already all of this tension uh, around the country, which you know, uh, I was previously unaware of, uh, but there was a rise of tension between the Hutus and Tutsis who are always in competition for power, kind of like the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, and then there's a small group in Rwanda that's actually suffered the most, the Twas. This group uh, is on the brink of extinction there's less than 30,000 individuals living. So you can even fill a stadium with this one population. And they were the original inhabitants of Rwanda. So now the genocide starts. And what happened was um, extremist Hutus started going house to house, butchering Tutsis. And you had the RPF uh, that also had a contingent uh, a group. Um, I think it was a battalion in the city of Kigali that started shelling uh, the city of Kigali. So now I'm hearing explosions on one side, from one side, whistling over my head and dropping on the other side. And they would also come into neighborhoods and they would raid and kill people. Uh, sometimes they would select families. Uh, if any of you have not heard of this uh, famous Rwandan artist, read his book. His name is Korne Nyungura. I'm gonna give out, uh, I'm gonna give out the spelling. Uh, he talks about how his family was killed in how the RPF would basically come into various places. That's the most famous story. There's a bunch of those type of stories. So now we start fleeing. First, we went into hiding because we were afraid that our neighbors would come and butcher us. And we would hear voices inside of the house of people searching for us, but we were hiding in a dog house in a storage, uh, behind the storage. Then we were smuggled out of that little uh, hiding place and taken to a neighbor who sheltered us for a while and then hired a pickup truck that took us from the city and took us uh, near the border of Congo. But along the way, we kept getting stopped and they wanted to kill us. Uh, they would bang the machetes on the, on, the, on the truck and they would uh, threaten to kill. Sometimes they would take us out of the car, uh, out of the truck, and it was a really small truck with, packed with a whole bunch of people. And the driver would continue negotiating and negotiating and every time somebody would intervene and they would, let us keep going. At one point, they stopped us, <clears throat> took just me and my mom out of this um, truck, and they ordered the truck to leave. And then they took us away from the street, and they ordered us to dig our own graves because they, they, would, they needed to bury us after they killed us. And then a bunch of neighbors, strangers, I had never stopped in this place before, just started running up. And they started yelling from a distance saying, don't kill them, leave them alone. And it was mostly women, all the men, and some kids. 
And then the driver came back. He came back twice with two different guys that negotiated for us for hours and hours and hours. It was mid-afternoon when we got to this place. It was pitch black when somebody eventually said, you know what, this boy and his mom are not going to make it five miles from here. Let somebody else kill them. And somehow they agreed to it. And so we ended up sheltering at another house for months until the bombing campaign by the RPF got closer and closer and we crossed into the Congo. And then there was other issues with cholera killing a whole bunch of people. Um, but we were rescued from Congo by an American aid worker that took us to Uganda and eventually we came to the US. So I wanna stop there um, about my story, but how did I stop sp start speaking and why? Um, I actually didn't want to speak or tell my story when I got here. I was, I was really afraid um, of even sharing it, um, and I really wanted to just forget it. And I went through a whole four years of, um, of high school thinking about it. And then when I got to college, I read the book of uh, Frederick Douglass. Anybody heard of him? <laughs> so when I read the book, I, um, when I read the book, excuse me, what, what, can, can, can you let him? Can, can you? In can we let him speak? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank. You. When um, I read the book, I just saw this seven-year-old boy sold into slavery. Basically, became somebody's lawnmower, for somebody's microwave. He was, he was not a person. He was property for somebody. Just like we have these cameras, right? You push a button, you do this. Anyway, so he teaches himself how to read and write. And he frees himself, frees a bunch of other people, and just through storytelling and sharing the stories of how horrible slavery was, he was able to contribute a lot to the abolition of slavery. And I had this story also. And there was all these atrocities happening in the Congo. And so I decided to start speaking out and telling my story. And many caught fire, and here I am telling the story at IPS. Um, but I just... so. It's February, right? And it's Black History Month. So I just kind of want to put this in the context of Black history and um, use the, um, the analogy of, um, of, of, of um, the Black history theme. Mm -hmm. How many of you in the room, knowing what you know about slavery today, would support slavery? Show of hand. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll wait. <laughs> it's one person. OK, how many of you? <laughs> okay. Oh, hand down, right? <laughs> okay. How many of you in the room would do something, even if it, 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 it's a small inconvenience to your normal life, to do something to stop slavery? Show of hand. Okay, that's everybody. Okay, what we have today in the Congo is very similar to what happened in slavery. What happened with slavery is it was the extracting of resources. The resources were human at the time. So human resources were being taken from Africa to the Americas. Today, we have the resources that we actually use in our cell phones and other technologies and aeronautics and all kinds of uh, uh, technologies to power up and, and, and keep us moving in our, in our daily lives. But these tools, we can also use them to actually advocate and push for a stopping of this practice. So the resources are the coal tan and all of the other resources coming from the Congo. Who is doing it? And who was doing, who was carrying out slavery? Corporations. And we have multinational corporations basically robbing the Congolese people, displacing and robbing and taking and making a profit off of the suffering of Congolese people and the people of the Great Lakes region. How did they get away with it? They had cover from the government. They had laws that made it legal to actually do that. That's what we have today. That's what Judy was talking about. When you have uh, basically the US government providing diplomatic and, and, and uh, political cover to local players like the Kagames and the Musevenis and the Kabilas who have been involved in the massacres of millions of people in the region, that's how these corporations are getting away with it. Who were the other players, the African players? Whenever they couldn't just grab people and put them on the boats, and I've been to Gorea Island, it's horrible. A room like this, you will put hundreds of people ready to ship them off. 
it's, I mean, the rooms are really tiny uh, when you look at them to be, to jam that many people in there. It's like sardine. Now, the local players, the, the local kings and, and, uh, and um, uh, rulers in Africa at the time were selling other Africans into slavery. That's what we have with the Kagames and the Musevenis and the Kabilas. That is what they're doing. They're doing the bidding of these corporations and Western governments. And how else did they get away with it? The media was basically glorifying this practice as good business. And then the individuals like us were totally silent about it. And silence is consent. And the other thing that was happening, the masses were suffering. What we've had in the Great Lakes region is nearly 10 million people have lost their lives in the last 30 years. And it's also estimated that about 10 million people lost their lives in the Atlantic Ocean crossing from Africa to the Americas. It's very, very similar. I hope that analogy makes sense, does it? Okay. Um, so what does it have to do with us today? We're paying for it because we are taxpayers. And the U.S. is providing military support and aid and diplomatic cover and funding for uh, a lot of the actors who are destroying the lives of the people in the Great Lakes region. And that's our money that's being used to do that. And we have a right to ask the questions and to actually demand that they stop doing this. So what can we do? I just have three. There's a whole bunch, but I have three. I wanna start with, um, has anybody heard about the atrocities against women in the Congo? And have you heard of Nobel Peace Prize winner, Dr. Dennis Mukwege? So he's been calling for, a, for tribunals to try the people responsible for the crimes documented in the UN mapping report that was released in 2010. That report talks about so many crimes, but there's only 600 and some odd incidents only, it was on only documenting the major crimes. There's still a whole bunch more. One of them was genocide committed by the Rwandan troops. Others were crazy amounts of massacres that were committed against the Congolese people. The Congolese people have suffered immensely and we need to demand justice for them. And so we need to support the call by Dr. Dennis Mukwege and the Congolese civil society to set up these uh, international tribunals to try those who are documented at least in this report and hopefully even more. Uh, the second thing I would ask for is that the US has sanctioned a whole bunch of people around the world. We have reports that generals in Rwanda have actually been leading rebellions in the Congo. General, I'll just mention a few names, General James Kabarebe, General Jack Nziza, General Charles Kayonga, and you'll see uh, a bunch of those names actually uh, in Judy's book. It's, uh, it's like, I can't remember the page, but it's in the book. Uh, and you'll see all those crimes, it's horrible. Uh, and the third is to stop military support of uh, the Rwandan military. So um, that's, that's all I'm asking. <laughs> and I'm not sure that it actually inconveniences you that much but you can actually do something really great by doing something really small. Thank you so much for your time. You know, for those of you who have worked on uh, the Great Lakes region, uh, you know that this is an issue that's been going on for decades and that the people in that region, uh, they are demanding justice. Uh, both of the speakers, Judy and Claude, uh, clearly laid that out. Uh, why it's important. Uh, there is a human face uh, to that. You know, I uh, usually share the story of two people. Uh, one is my uh, uncle who disappeared for three years after three years was found decapitated, right? And another is a colleague of mine. We work very closely. His name was uh, Father Vincent Machosi. He had a website called uh, Beni Lubero documenting the crimes taking place in the East. And the way I found out that he was killed was a Facebook feed. So whenever I'm hearing the death of uh, Kobe Bryant and how people were 
angry at TMZ? How do you disclose that? Uh, we in the Great Lakes region sometimes are faced uh, by this type of information atrocities coming to us at a very fast pace, uh, a fast pace for three decades, literally. Uganda, Rwanda, Congo, we all have suffered that. And what the people are yearning for is justice. And there are mechanisms uh, that's been proposed that you know, we hope uh, people will support, the people on the ground are continuing to fight uh, for justice. And we hope that those of you who came here, that's the biggest message, that the crimes have to be, uh, people who have committed crimes have to be held accountable. And the people who have suffered uh, so much can feel that there is there has been some form of justice for the crimes committed. Um, I will uh, encourage those who are watching us on live stream uh, to leave your comment. I will go through the feeds. I put some of the questions, and I think we'll try to change a bit for the questions. I think you know, we can engage with the audience. Uh, that should be fine. Uh, what I will request first is if there are any congressional staffer in the room to first uh, raise their hand and ask questions, or anyone from the press first. And after that, we will take uh, questions from uh, others. If you are a congressional staffer, would like to identify yourself, or from the press, uh, please raise your hands, I will come to you, and then we'll engage. So I wanna pose this uh, the first question to both of you. There seems to be um, an attempt to silence anyone who doesn't abide with the narrative from Kigali, specifically Paul Kagame and his government. You know, the narrative of what has actually unfolded, not just in Rwanda, but the region. Uh, and I'll start with Judy and then come to you. Uh, I would like to know, why are people trying so much to silence you? And I just listened to your presentation. I saw you presented the sources of your information. Uh, why are people are trying to silence you, Judy? Well, I, you know, the official narrative, as I said, goes to the heart of Kagame's moral legitimacy. Um, speak up a little bit. And that the official narrative, Kambali's asked why uh, I'm being silenced or people are trying to silence me. It's because um, there are vested interests, not only in Rwanda, uh, but elsewhere, uh, vested interests uh, in keeping this story under wraps, in people not understanding fully uh, what really happened during the genocide. And I think if Kagame's uh, crimes are fully exposed, then and the U.S. complicity in those crimes, not only in Rwanda, but certainly in Congo, uh, will be exposed. And that it possibly will bring a lot of people down. Um, a very powerful insiders at the UN and uh, in previous administrations here, here in Washington. So there's that. There's also the vested financial, uh, commercial interests, multinationals, uh, in, in maintaining Kagame in place because he opened up that corridor for all the uh, Western mining interests. And now there are artisanal small-scale mining interests that the Chinese have uh, gotten engaged in. And so there's a whole, I would say, military, industrial, and financial kind of um, network whose interests are very much key to maintaining the status quo. And so I think when Kagame sends hit squads to various African countries to silence whistleblowers, to kill Rwandans and Congolese, um, very little of that percolates and, and, and gets, um, you know, very little of that is is known in, in international media. We don't hear about it. Kagame sends hit squads here, intimidates, harass, and and uh, tries to silence people. And that's only a story that we've heard recently. And for you, Claude, why, are you, uh, why is Kagame <coughs> and the Rwandan government trying so hard to silence a Rwandan genocide survivor? Um, so... The reason is because the more the whole story gets out and the whole truth gets out, Kagame is no longer the saint that pretends to have stopped the to have stopped the genocide when it's known. By the way, I've, I have 
a video testimony from one of his former bodyguards, James Munyandinda, stating that they sent um, they sent troops and soldiers to, inf to, to, to mix in with the militias that were killing Tutsis in 1994. I have that testimony, and I have it from also um, Alois Rienzi, who was also his bodyguard. Um, now, what he doesn't want is, you know, Kagame has this great image of, you know, he's built up Rwanda. It's a nice and beautiful country. The streets are clean. And nobody says that about South Africa, right? <laughs> but if you go to Cape Town, it's a beautiful city. It's very clean. But you don't talk about it being clean. You look at the social issues. But he wants to hide behind this image of clean streets where they're taking people off the streets, jailing them, torturing them. Uh, because they're either homeless, they're street kids, they're uh, street vendors, or they just don't look clean for the tourists and, and the people who uh, uh, praise him. He also has a lot of, uh, you know, people like Bill Clinton and Tony Blair and others who promote his image. And he spends a lot of money here in the U.S. We have documentation on uh, PR, you know, to, to maintain a, a, this, this great image. So when you talk about the crimes that he and his military committed, he knows that justice is coming. And we have seen various African warlords, which Kagame is, um, end up in, uh, in prison. You know, there's Charles Taylor of Liberia. Um, and then you also have, which it was a beautiful thing. It took 30 years, but it happened. He sent a break of Chad, had tortured people. And the people who knew his crimes never backed down you know, from pursuing justice. That's why they want to silence us. And I also want to talk about how they do it. So there's this uh, cancel culture. You guys know about it, right? <laughs> um, in Rwanda, nobody can speak and talk about these crimes. They will be killed or jailed forever. And um, people are killed inside and abroad, inside of Rwanda and abroad. Sometimes for seeking out and sometimes not for speaking out because those refugees, the 200,000 refugees that were killed in the Congo had not said anything. A bunch of Rwandan people who have been killed had not said anything. It's actually a good thing to speak up because then it's going to take them a whole lot more work <laughs> to actually, you know, do something. So they don't want more people speaking out. And what they do outside of Rwanda, they use, uh, there is a wing of the government that pretends to be a non-governmental organization. It's known as the Rwanda diaspora. And the way they operate, it's under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Rwanda. So it's like an embassy outside of the real embassy. And uh, some of what they do, of course, they disguise themselves as the Rwandan community of uh, Atlanta, of the Rwanda community in USA, the Rwanda community of Chicago, the Rwanda community of the DMV. And what they do, a part of it is actually um, spying on Rwandans around the world. There's been reports in Canada, in Australia, in Kenya, in South Africa, I mean, all over the world, uh, Belgium. Um, they blackmail people, they harass people. And of course, another thing that they do is organize these cult events to bring Kagame into town. They've done it here in the US, in, in Chicago, in Boston, in Atlanta. They call it Rwanda Day. And they basically bust people in to come and praise Kagame, that's the role of the Rwanda diaspora, the formal organization, not the diaspora as a totality. And so this organization is who basically, as far as canceling all these events, a lot of times is speaking up for members of that organization or leaders of that organization, a lot of times are out there trying to get these events canceled. The thing they don't want to do is they don't actually want to sit and challenge what I'm saying or what we are saying they just want to shut it down because it's too damaging and it makes they cannot actually speak intelligently and make any real sense when it comes to talking about what happened, the evidence and how criminal Kagame is. They just want to force feed and force it down people's throat that Kagame stopped the genocide, which is incorrect. For sure, there were people who were hiding in the mountains and the valleys who the RPF soldiers found and saved. That's true. However, as far as stopping the genocide itself, Kagame himself told General Romeo Dallaire, it's in his book, that in order to win this war, there's going to have to be some sacrifices. 
the sacrifices were the Tutsis who were inside of Rwanda uh, and not a part of the RPF. The other thing is, and I'm going to stop here, Dallaire asked him, win the war quickly so we can stop the killing of the Tutsis. He said, no, we're going to do it in our own time. So all of this information is out there, but the more we speak out, the more we have events like this and it's broadcast everywhere, the more it's known and the more people are willing to take action because I saw everybody raise their hand and say, I would do something against slavery. So <laughs> I'm going to hold you all to it. <laughs> all right. Uh, any congressional staff press? Hi, I'm Jacqueline Woodlawn with uh, Finding Is Necessary on Sputnik Radio and the Bill Lynch Network. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for both of you for your book and um, for you coming and speaking out. Um, we talk a lot on Finding Is Necessary about U.S. militarism around the world, imperialism, colonialism, all the issues that you mentioned. But uh, particularly for U.S. audiences, and especially for the black community, how do you tie uh, what has been covered up in regard to the Rwandan genocide um, with the current U.S. military involvement in the Kagame regime and with the larger expansion of U.S. military uh, through bases and covert operations throughout Africa? and how that all ties into this current ongoing great powers competition for the resources, like what are in uh, the Congo and, and the region. Well, uh, just anecdotally, and I'll let Kambali uh, respond because I think he'd have a lot to say about this, but when the UN mapping report came out that uh, stated very clearly that Kagame's troops likely committed genocide in the Congo, in 1996 and 97, uh, Kagame used his influence, formidable influence at the UN and tried to delay or and get the change, the wording of the UN document changed. And there was, uh, the UN released the document anyhow and uh, the findings are there for everyone to see. But he was very upset and the end result of his power at the UN and his influence through UN peacekeeping was that no ad hoc tribunal was ever created to prosecute these devastating crimes in Congo. I mean, we're 2020 and 10 years later that Washington has not put its backing support behind a tribunal to prosecute Kagame or other belligerents for all the millions of people who have died. And so therein lies the power of Kagame today through peacekeeping at the UN in, and those peacekeepers are used, as I mentioned, uh, for the war on terror that the United States is, is waging in the Middle East, but also particularly in Africa, that's where Kagame's uh, peacekeepers are, his soldiers. That's very valuable to the US and so that's that's his trump card. And um, we need to talk about these issues. We need to force uh, congressional hearings and force people, uh, force elected leaders to support a UN tribunal. And that is where these crimes will be laid out, uh, uh, discussed and prosecuted. So to, just add, uh, very briefly, uh, I'm sure you saw not long ago there was a young um, man from uh, Chicago who was killed in uh, Camp Simba in Kenya, right? Uh, this young black man with his death kind of opened my eyes into even thinking about U.S. militarism differently because while we may talk about the U.S. power and U.S. Ex imperial uh, power being extended across the African continent, ordinary citizens actually somehow participate. No, I can. I do not know the story of the young man. Uh, I believe that there was maybe uh, a ROTC at his high school, maybe a an army officer who came to uh, his school saying that join the U.S. military, you will have great benefits. I'm saying that from experience because I went to high school here. While well, they tell you you will have great uh, medical, dental, 
you'll get to travel the world, uh, you, you won't pay taxes on the US military bases. That's how they sell it. They sell, they try to sell it to me. The only reason why I didn't end up at the, in the uh, US military, because I was underage, the officer had to come to my house and my mom looked at me like, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you trying to show us? Mom, they'll pay for me. Yeah. Right? So when you have this young black man now ending up in Camp Simba, assassinated by Al-Shabaab, for me now in the college, we need to educate people by US uh, military, US Africa, right? Because he, he, not only it affect Africans, where the African uh, dictators, the strong men, are being armed, trained. Paul Kagame was trained as a Ugandan soldier <coughs> here in the United States. Nothing happened from that. We have to go to this deployment with building drone bases, but there is no pushback for the. Uh, We can go on uh, on Capitol Hill and say there is something called Africom that should be defend, uh, defunded. There is no reason why the United States should be so bold to have a military base on the African continent, while no African country has a military base, not even in Kansas. <laughs> right? So we don't have any. So why do we have foreign military bases? And what does that enable? It emboldens the African dictators, because they use it, right? They say, we have the US on our side. Look at, when you fly to Nairobi, you see the planes, the military plane there. So the president of Kenya can say, hey, the United States have my support, uh, is supporting me, and I can do crimes. And that's exactly what Paul Kagame has done. He knows that his military is funded by the US military. He knows that he get payment from the United Nations uh, doing this peacekeeping mission. Not only that, some of the commanders who go to these peacekeeping missions are commanders who have been indicted by the Spanish court, which tried Pinochet, by the way. You know, they, they indicted uh, 40 random generals, but these generals end up as the head of UN peacekeeping missions, and no one is stopping them from that. So we have to do our, uh, our work as citizens. It's not easy. But if we could end apartheid, we can end what's happening in the Congo and uh, in the region. Yeah, I, um, uh, thank you for that. I just want to, uh, when you said something about why uh, there's not so much of a pushback within the United States for this, um, this is more of a comment, and it's a, a pan Africanist. And there's a large African, well, I would say African population, a black population, if you want to make sense, in the United States because of what's happened. We are not taught or we are dissuaded in so many forms to not identify with Africa. There should be no reason why there's not some formidable uh, force that is pushing back on U.S. policies in Africa and creating a really uh, transcontinental relationship between people of African descent around the world. And so this is some of the out, you know, some of the uh, fallout from that is the fact that we don't really identify with Africa uh, and everyone should be, if you're a human being and and support peace and justice, you should be doing it. But at the same time, it shows a really stark contradiction that there are about, was it, 40 some or uh, 30 some million people of African descent in this country that are allowing uh, such a such a relationship to happen in our in our motherland. And so we, I think the Pan-Africanism and the Pan-African movement, our predecessors like Malcolm X and so many other people before us, there was a reason why uh, we're not uh, allowed or, or dissuaded in so many ways to not identify with Africa. So I'll take three questions, see if there, there is no more press and Congress. OK, so we go here, there, not there. And then the third round will be you. Uh, what I would like for you to do is uh, you introduce, uh, you present yourself, who you are, and your affiliation. And a brief question. Uh, my, name, my name is Abby Jollis. I'm a, an international human rights litigator practicing uh, worldwide. And I, I actually had a landmark a decision, which uh, Claude is familiar with, at the Rwanda Tribunal. But what I'm interested in now are two things, and I, I, I wanna, would be interested to see what Claude has to, to say about it. One is, has the amount of money uh, that the U.S. is contributing uh, to uh, gone down or up, or has it stayed the same since, since 2016? And then the second 
uh, question is, is to speak about uh, the, I'm, I'm very familiar with the, the much activity around the creating uh, tribunals in, in Congo. And I even thought that I might have the opportunity to be a part of it. Uh, that that is a, it hasn't happened, and I haven't. But I'm wondering uh, what Claude you would say about having the UN uh, be in charge of that. Uh, where uh, well, I've I've spoken to people on the Hill, and maybe you could include Congressman Chris Smith, who's been uh, really in, uh, working uh, to 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 do something in this area. But uh, there there is some I heard whispering. Uh, on the Hill that they would, uh, maybe they, they would uh, set up a tribunal and the, the UN wouldn't be in charge of it. So they couldn't take their people who, you know, the known criminals and put them in, in a position to make them judges and, you know, prosecutors and all that. So that's it. I'm sorry. Cool. Uh, so thank you for the question. Um, it actually, um, the amount that the U.S. gives to uh, Rwanda went down and then it went back up. Uh, but it's still not to the level that it used to be about. So when it started going down is when the M23 was uh, just ravaging the Eastern Congo, led by the three generals that I mentioned, General James Kabarebe, General Jack Nziza, and General Charles Kayonga. By the way, uh, me and Kambali refer to them as um, criminals without borders. You guys heard of... Uh, <laughs> Reporters Without Borders, Doctors Without Borders, we have criminals without borders because they're committing crim crimes in Uganda, in Rwanda, in Congo. Anyway, South Africa, South Africa Kenya, <laughs> uh, all over. Now, what we have is um, we, we did a push, one, to even release the reports that they were doing this. Then the U.S. withheld $200,000. That's one person's salary, right? Right. <laughs> Uh, but that that uh, had a domino effect across all of the donors. And what ended up happening is the U.S. also started squeezing down on its uh, purse and other donors. The U.S. became the number one donor instead of the U.K. Uh, however, still, the amount went down by, by 2017, the amount had gone down by about 25%. And since then, it's gone up, um, I, th I think it's like um, maybe $10 million dollars. No, so not that much, but uh, it seems to be going up a little bit since 2017. I see. I see uh, the U.S. influence at the UN as the biggest problem. It's not the UN. The UN system is broken, absolutely, because of competing interests, and there were so many problems with the tribunal on Rwanda, and therefore, you know, they granted Kagame immunity legal immunity, but it was the U.S.'s actions that did that. The U.N. was supposed to try Kagame and his henchmen for those crimes. The U.S. made sure that it did not. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm always open to goodwill and certainly efforts to get a, a tribunal, to back an ad hoc tribunal in the Congo and, and have that support start here in the U.S. I'd love to be surprised. But, um, and I know, I know the work of Christopher, Christopher Smith, who's brilliant, but I, I think there's a political and military industrial establishment here that doesn't want that to happen. And so the blocking that the challenge is, 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 is right here. Yeah, but I think if it happened through the UN, uh, it would be, I would be welcoming, I would welcome it as long as it's not there to protect the perpetrators or to provide, you know, some type of, uh, one-sided or biased uh, justice, and it takes into account what the people have really lived. So let's get the stack. I made a mistake to a lot of questions. We're gonna do, the, there is a person there, there, and then Alula. And to add to that point, uh, the Congolese people's call for transitional justice is a mixed court chamber. Mm -hmm. And that call is in the UN mapping exercise report. It's explicit, a tribunal inside of the RC to make it cheaper to find information instead of The Hague or anywhere else. And the civil society is beyond that. And this is also the call that we support from Dr. Mukwege that there should be a tribunal for those crimes. If any mechanism creates that tribunal, which is a miscue with local and international judges, that will go alongside what uh, the Congolese people uh, would like. So we'll go to you. 
him and then Alula. So we stack the questions and then they respond to all three. Yes, my name is Bob Gris. I'm a health policy researcher, but that's not relevant to this discussion. Um, in the story that Judy is telling, there are different stages in terms of Kagami's um, role in violence. I heard that he provoked the, the uh, genocide through the killing of the, pre the Tutsi president in this plane uh, crash. Right. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I'm hearing that after the genocide, the Tutsis played a role, and I guess Kagame as the leader of the Tutsis played a role in ending that genocide in Rwanda, but then followed that uh, role in to the Congo, where Hutus ran and then com committed uh, various crimes of genocide against uh, Hutus and I guess Congolese also in the Congo. What I'm trying to understand is whether the Western interest in minerals in the Congo was responsible for Kagame's activities before the uh, Rwandan genocide, or whether the Western imperialists, in a sense, uh, took advantage of this conflict in, the, in Rwanda and saw Kagame as a military leader who they could use to persecute, uh, uh, to, to, do, to dominate the economy of the Congo. Uh, if that's the case, the implications of a reconciliation, I have always heard that the, that the if Rwandan... If you don't mind, I would like to cut you short because we are going to one study. Yeah. So can you make your question a bit brief? In two sentences, the reconciliation process about Rwanda is usually considered just an internal dispute between Hutus and Tutsis and be resolved that way. It sounds like the story you're telling requires expanding that, uh, that uh, context and uh, whether the UN is doing that or whether it should be done through an African uh, tribunal uh, that to me is is the challenge here. Okay, so make sure it's brief. Yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Jacques Mubizi. I'm uh, one of the members of the Rwandan community. So Jacques Mubizi. Jacques Mubizi. Yeah. Um, and so basically, uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of counter all the uh, Judy Weaver mentioned her book and what code had been said, uh, had, had been saying. Uh, during this, uh, this uh, forum. Uh, basically, for anybody who does not know Rwanda, who have never been to Rwanda, um, you would you would just say yes, um, what they're saying is all credible, right? But you have to take the context of somebody who's Rwandan. I don't work for the government of Rwanda. I'm just a citizen here, but I happen to be from Rwanda, right? So I read uh, some of the, you know, uh, the stories in your book, um, many of them are not even close to the reality. Never occurred, never happened. Can you identify those things as not never yeah, occurred? The massacre in Bumba, the accusation of James Cavalier killing mass, you know, Hutus. Let me just uh, talk about the massacre in Buyumba Stadium. That massacre, the testimony of that massacre in which Kagame's troops rounded up thousands of Hutus, brought them to a soccer stadium in April and massacred them brutally. That the evidence for those crimes, you say it didn't happen, is in ICTR documents. Yeah, and so finish, let yeah, uh, so there that yeah, you say it question. didn't happen. Yeah, let me just say there were, there were killings, uh, but it, to 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 really make the long story short, because we you know 
we're running out of time here. We're gonna go back to work. Thank some you. of us. Yeah. Um, to long story short, is that Kagame really stopped the genocide? Just give that idea that if the army of Kagame, right, the RPA, would have killed, uh, would have go and engage in a mass killing, do you think there could be a state of Rwanda? There would not be a state of Rwanda. So the idea was just to stop anybody who was killing other people. And kick out the militia in the army who are killing, you know, the minority, the Tutsi. Th and thank you for your question. Tutsi. If you don't have any other questions, yes. I have to jump to this. I would just, just to briefly say, no, so don't believe Your question is around Buyumba, and she's going to respond to that. So let's go to the next one. So she can either provide the evidence on that question. So, sir. First of all, I'm Dr. George Alula. As many of you know me, it has been 10 years almost that uh, Tamale and Claude we didn't meet since the mapping report at the, the hill. And also the problem at the hill I called the Rwandan people to stop the genocide in Congo. When I see Judy River, for which it turns, she has to put her life in line to write about something. The friend of the Congo has been calling for years to break the silence. You are so young, Kambale, finishing your high school, when I know you with my brother there. Without your work, some of us give up because we give a lot. 10 years of activism. I see this room is full of people who can change the world because you are able to. I believe on that. That's why I stopped working and come just to support you because, you know, I wrote a book on the Congo genocide. The same message I would give to my brother here. I grew up with the Bisengmana family in Congo. So I grew up close to the Rwandan people. So when the genocide happened in Rwanda, I ran a fundraising where I put $5,000 in Paris. The fundraising I ran was for in UNICEF and the Francophone organization. My brother, you were not at the stadium. You see a young boy talking about his own story. You were not there either. No, no. Look, look at, look, listen to me, please. I was seven years old in Kisangani when the war happened there. Across bodies of people asking my mom, "What is this?" I was among those young, those young boy that and girl that you see processing when the war happened. It happened to me, and I don't know why I tie my life with this kind of situation because I saw many deaths, many of them. That's why I stand up to stop and calling the world to stop the genocide in Congo. You can come and say everything she say is a lie. No, I am the one who pushed the UN to publish the mapping report because I took the report, I put it in the book, they ignored economic genocide in 2009 when Obama came in power. Brother and sister, we need to stop that. When we're talking about the situation, how to help Paul Kagame to change his life, how to help those leaders who bring our region in a worse situation like that, that we live in. 12 to 10, 18 million people. We are here about to deny 3.5 million. 3.5 million, that was a little number. No, we need to help the Congo. Genocide is when you're killing people, putting them on the street, breaking the, the, the infrastructure. That's the definition of the genocide. Don't ask it out. This gentleman was so little. For what reason? Claude will come in here and say, oh, my mom and little, how can he fake a kind of the story? So just sometimes silence is better. Instead of coming and just saying, no, it didn't happen. I thank you so much for thank your time. You. So we'll address your question. I think uh, Judy can address that around the narrative. I, I think I would agree with the latter mm -hmm. part of what you said. Uh, that um, the U.S. Uh, took advantage of what Kagame did and then saw an opportunity to open up this corridor where the world economy starts. But certainly Kagame was, as Claude mentioned, he was trained in the U.S., um, long-standing ties from the 1980s and 1990, very solid, unbridled support, I would call it, as Kagame was committing crimes during the invasion war, during the genocide, covering that up, praising him, 
and then green lighting assisting his invasion in the Congo. It is complicit support. And just uh, to add real quick, um, it was also an opportunity to replace Mobutu, who was the uh, local puppet or the, if I could use that slave, slavery um, analogy, the seller, the African seller of slaves, uh, Mobutu was old. It was time to replace him. So they replaced him with Kagame and uh, Museveni. And the reconciliation part, yes, it needs to expand. It can't just be inside of Rwanda and between the Hutus and the Tutsis and those who agree with Kagame and those who don't. And if you want to see how reconciled Rwanda is, just check my timeline. <laughs> Do you want to uh, go back to his question? A challenge one of the information you provided. Yes. You already answered, but do you have any addition to it? I just want, uh, very, very briefly, uh, one of the investigators at the Special Investigations Unit of the ICTR that Abby would know about, but, you know, one of these investigators said to me, never in his life. The ICTR is the a UN tribunal that was set up to try the the crimes in Rwanda. Sorry, these acronyms. And so, um, what was the name of the the? I don't know. I, it's I can't say who he is. But the investigator. What I'm saying is, a lot of people have heard about the clandestine unit. So what I'm saying, the investigator who um, investigated the uh, Buyumba Stadium massacre that this man uh, says did not it, happen. Um, he said never in his life has he seen so much evidence. He had um, witnesses who brought um, perpetrators, who brought those who choose men, women, and children, and old people to the stadium. Witnesses of people who were outside guarding so that people, other uh, people wouldn't come and see. He had uh, perpetrators of, of RPF soldiers who gave testimony of what they did inside the stadium. He had the people who brought the corpses out after they were uh, massacred and then uh, buried them, took them off. Never before had he been involved in a case where he had so much information. This man here says this did not happen. And I you see- what I'm saying, you could have been- We should not have a debate. She's uh, responding I'm telling question. you, uh, you're telling me my book is uh, full of uh, unsubstantiated claims. This has been documented by the UN Tribunal. This man's voice is trembling because there has been systematic gaslighting of victims in Congo and in Rwanda who are victims of Kagame's crimes. And gaslighting is when people start questioning the reality of their own experiences. We should not be here today, 25 years after <coughs> the genocide mm -hmm. and 20 years after Kagame invaded Congo and still be begging to or, 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 or nervous to speak about this. This should be part mm -hmm. of the popular discourse. But, you know, unfortunately isn't, that's why we're here. Yeah, uh, and just to add, I, I also spoke to the, a lot of those witnesses and many others, and it and it is uh, this is why I I can't even even I've worked you know for a very long time uh, in and around this area, and I, and I have at, spoken to these people. I I have in some cases become part of their lives. It it's very hard if you're actually working in it. it it's hard, and I I understand. 100%. And for a seven-year-old to have to see all of that, I mean, anybody in this room who has children, they they would know what that's like. You, know, you try to not have your children dig their own graves or whatever. I mean, you know, so anyway, I just I just wanted to say that I, yeah. I, I also... So the, I know that we ran out of time. Uh, I wish that we could have a petition to add more hours in a day, uh, <laughs> but that's not possible. <laughs> uh, so as we share that uh, Judy is here, uh, she has a book. Uh, she has provi she can provide evidence for what is there, uh, unless people say that the International Tribunal for Rwanda does not uh, the evidence from there is not true, which means that you have implications for that. So her book is here. She's gonna she's gonna stay for signing the book. I hope Mr. Jack Nibizi from the Rwandan community can stay to get a copy. If you don't it's autograph. I have one. Autograph uh, that way that uh, we all can uh, learn more from the book. And I, and I, I believe, uh,
Brother Maurice is going to handle the book sales at the table there, and then you can come back in here and speak to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Right, thank, you, everyone. thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we do a lot of stuff here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.